So let's let's crack right on. Let's um, as mentioned, I am a Java developer. So let's take a look at some code and uh, and review this code. So this is some real code in a real project that I was working on some time ago. It's open source, so I don't feel bad showing it to anybody. And um, if you're reading this code. There's probably a few things in here that you personally don't like. Uh, I won't get you to call out the things that, that you don't like because there's several hundred people on the call. But um, so I will go through some of my own personal pet peeves with this code. Firstly, IntelliJ IDEA gives you warnings for a reason, and it's a good idea to heed those warnings and do something about them or, um, or turn off the warnings if necessary. Secondly, <laughs> I, I particularly love the exception messages. This is impossible. Mm, okay. And how is name null? Uh, I like the uh, like you being the um, being the English sarcastic like. I like the inconsistent white space between before my curly braces. Um, this if statement has curly braces. These if statements do not have curly braces. This for loop is actually a while loop disguised as a for loop. These variable names are not really names, being as how they are just single characters. Uh, this variable name, however, is slightly misleading as it's called table, but is actually a string. So that um, implies something that perhaps it implies that it's a collection when in actual fact it's not a collection. Uh, this method name, mm, I don't know how many people who are listening to this are Java developers, but generally in Java, we don't use underscores in method names. So that's wildly inconsistent with most code standards. Uh, this method call, this is not using IntelliJ IDEA's parameter name hints, which is one of my favorite features. And instead, you're calling this method with a null, with three zeros, and a bunch of other stuff. And it's not at all clear to me what those values are or what they should be. And, um, and then finally, after push, putting a bunch of stuff into a collection, then we sort that collection and then turn it into a different data structure. Now, I'm not sure what this code is doing, but I'm fairly certain you shouldn't be putting stuff into one data structure and then shoving it into a different data structure at the end. So if I was reviewing this code, I would have one or two things to say about this code. And these things uh, vary between sort of fairly insignificant, like white space, to potentially more significant or certainly uh, performance impacting, like the choice of data structures and the, the algorithm used here to to sort the information. However, there's one really important point to consider about this code. This code works. It works as expected. It is tested. It is, it is used in production in a number of very large organizations, as this is library code. It's been downloaded by other organizations. It, is, it works within the performance parameters that are required, since it's code that manages um, a, a database connection. So in terms of the latency you get going over the wire to the database, any small performance problems around perhaps using incorrect data structures are massively outweighed by the, the latency of talking to a database. So I have a lot of opinions about how good this code is, but in actual fact, in terms of functionality, it's perfectly acceptable. It works, it's tested, it works within the, the non-functional parameters such as performance. Our problem as developers is that having opinions on code is an occupational hazard. So we read other people's code and we have opinions on that code. In fact, I would argue having opinions on code is actually an occupational requirement. It's really important for us to understand what good code looks like because this is how we can write better code. This is how we can suggest improvements to the code that we inherit. So it's actually very important for us to have opinions on what good code looks like. As a, a slight aside, are we harder on other people's code than our own? I said we have opinions on code when we read other people's code. Um, I was reading something about code review best practices, and this person was saying that they caught themselves and they are harder on other people's code. They are more critical of other people's code than they are of their own code. I don't know if most people work like that. I think what's actually true is that when we read code, regardless of who wrote it, we are more critical of that code. An example of this is when we read our own code six months later, we look at that and go, oh my goodness, who wrote this? And, uh, and it turns out it was us. So we, when we read code, we think differently about it to when we write code. 
when we write code, we're trying to get that job done. Our head is in a particular space of our solution, what it looks like, how it's going to work, how to get the tests to pass. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about the shape of the code, even the readability of the code. When we read code, we have a different focus on, on that. And this is obviously very relevant to when we're doing code reviews. So what should we actually be looking for when we review other people's code, especially given the fact that we are more critical of code when we read it than when we write it? This, in fact, was my, uh, my first assignment as the Upsource Developer Advocate. Why don't you write a blog post about what to look for in a code review? And I thought, OK, that sounds, that sounds straightforward. I have opinions on this. And I can write those opinions down in a blog post. And it turns out that actually uh, it wasn't just one blog post. As I was writing the one blog post, it got longer and longer. And then I wrote another one and another one as I went into each area in more detail. And, uh, and it actually turned into a book. This is a free book you can download from, from JetBrains. It's in, uh, it's in LeanPub. This is a collection of all those blog posts. If you're interested in the specific things you could be looking for when you read other people's code, take a look at this. I'm not going to go into these things in, in a lot of detail in this webinar because we have covered this extensively in the book, in the blog posts, even in screencasts in the past. So after spending some time thinking about all the things you could be looking for in a code view, the next set of blog posts I wrote was a, a set of posts about the different workflows of a code view. It occurred to me that the things that you look for in a code view are dependent upon um, how your process works. If you review code at the end, when it's code complete, this is the kind of traditional code review, if you like, the gateway review, where I write my code, I submit it for review, and someone says whether it's good to go or not. Uh, more often than not, it becomes one of those battles of, oh, uh, you know, the, the reviewer doesn't like this, fix this. The reviewer doesn't like that, fix that. Um, and this is our kind of tra traditional mindset of what a code review is. Now, when you're in those situations, there are certain things which are quite difficult to fix. For example, fundamental design is, uh, is more time consuming to fix if you've already written the code. But there are other workflows like knowledge sharing. So I might actually commit the code into trunk. It might even be in production. And I send it out to all of the people on my team to say, this is what was done. Take a look. Let me know if it's sane. These sorts of knowledge sharing reviews have a different focus again. They're more around readability. They're more around making sure that the, the team understands what the code does. And the feedback you get on those code reviews is more likely to be things like, I don't really understand what this method do does, rather than, have you considered the performance of this? And then there's another workflow, which is early design feedback. So I might decide to sketch out a design in code, submit it to a branch, and then get other people to collaborate with me on the design and implementation of that. And there, again, you're going to have a different, uh, a different type of interaction with the reviewers than in the other workflows. So you have a number of different things you could be looking for when you're reviewing code. You have a number of different workflows you might be using when, you are, when you're reviewing code. And of course, on top of that, you have differences of opinion of, of the team, different layouts of the team. Some teams are very flat, some are very structured, different regulatory requirements, different requirements on the application. So it becomes very difficult to say what you should be looking for when you're reviewing code. And of course, the answer is, as always in all of these things, it depends. It depends on the team. It depends on the application. It depends on what you're trying to achieve with the code review. It depends on the expertise available. It depends on when you want to do it. It depends on the purposes, so on and so forth. So let's take a slight detour. And I'm going to talk to you about my first code review. When I was first asked to review someone else's code, I was working in a very large enterprise. I was. Um, I clearly was making the transition from a junior developer to a more senior developer, and my boss asked me to review this other person's code. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is my opportunity. This, I have been recognized as being an expert in code, as I am going to be reviewing someone else's code. And then my next thought was, I don't really know what I'm doing in this review. I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know what the purpose of this review is. I don't really know. Um, I don't really know how to do code reviews because in this team, we also, my code had never been reviewed. So I didn't have a, a basis of understanding of how code reviews worked. So I basically took it as a, as a way of um, 
inflicting my own standards upon the other person's code. At that time, I was very obsessed, well, I still am quite obsessed with automated testing, with um, sort of clean codes, more methods, uh, good method names, that kind of thing. So those are the sorts of things that I commented on in this particular code of view. But of course, underlying all of this, my understanding of a code of view is my job is to find problems in the code. My job is to look at this code and find all the reasons why it shouldn't go into production, find all the things that the code author did wrong. So that was kind of my idea of what code of views are. And I think that's kind of probably true of a lot of people. So given all of this preamble, I want to have a quick look at a quick, I say quick, a hopefully quick look at anti-patterns in, um, in code of views, the sorts of reasons why we find code of views difficult. The first anti-pattern is nitpicking. You saw me do this in the original code. In the, in the code right at the beginning, I started talking about white space and curly braces. And this really is not particularly useful in terms of the functionality of the code. It's just, um, it's just these little things that actually all of this stuff should be automated. Our formatting should be automated. Our checking of the formats should be automated. All of these tiny little things should be automated away so that we don't have a human coming up with these little things about there's no white space at the end of this file. These sorts of things are quite frustrating for the code author as the code author has worked very hard on trying to make the code work and the, the reviewer is looking at things like where's the white space and how long is this line. Automation can get rid of this quite easily. The next anti-pattern. I mentioned this briefly when I was talking about gateway code reviews. So in the case where you have a code review where I have written the code, I think it does what it's supposed to do, I've submitted it for review in the hope that it will go into production, and the code reviewer comes back with major design changes. This is very frustrating when this happens at the end of the code implementation, because I've already taken, whether it's hours, days, weeks, or months, I have taken a serious amount of time thinking through the design, um, possibly even talking through the design with other members of my team, possibly whiteboarding, implementing it, and then at the end being told it's wrong, do it all over again. This is a waste of everyone's time. What we should be doing in these cases is um, design should be, we should be having design patterns early on. If your code review is a gateway code review, that is not the place to be having design discussions. Either you can have them right up front if you're comfortable with doing upfront design, or you have periodic checks throughout the implementation where someone or some people who care about the design can come and take a look at the code and make sure it's on track. This sort of thing should be happen happening during implementation, not at the end of implementation. Inconsistent feedback. This could be inconsistent in terms of um, a person A really cares about formatting, person B really cares about performance, person C always cares about method names, or it could even be inconsistent in terms of the same reviewer comes back with inconsistent problems. In the first case where you have different reviewers with different things they care about, what happens is the code author will tend to submit their code to be reviewed by the people who, whose reviews they like, by the same people. So when their code more closely matches the reviewer's expectations, those are the people who will be reviewing that code. So you don't get the benefit of a wide variety of experience on that code review. In the second case, when you have the same reviewer um, coming back with different types of feedback, that is a failure in the process because each reviewer should understand what they're looking for every time. And when I submit my code into review, I should have a fairly clear idea of what the reviewer is looking for in advance. There shouldn't be any nasty surprises. I should kind of know what they're looking for in terms of data structures or design or formatting or, or um, design patterns or whatever it is. I should know in advance what the reviewer is looking for. I should be able to meet those expectations. Inconsistent feedback from the same reviewer comes from that reviewer not having clear a clear understanding of what they are reviewing and why. Antipattern, the ghost reviewer. I think this might be me. This is the reviewer where you submit your code for review and then you hear nothing back from the reviewer. And I know that I'm guilty of this. If the review is bigger than maybe five classes, I think I'll come back to this later when I've got time when I can look at it properly, when I can really think about it. And so this anti-pattern comes from having enormous reviews. 
There's another anti-pattern from having enormous reviews or lots of changes in a single review. There was a study done which shows that with um, code reviews, the bigger the the bigger the review, the bigger number of changes, actually the less feedback you get. Because people just look at that and go, oh my goodness, uh, okay, it's got tests, it seems to be doing more or less what it's supposed to do, fine, uh, it looks good to me. Whereas the small reviews where you've got just a few lines of code, then reviewers have a smaller amount of things to focus on and they will nitpick that and they will give you feedback on every single character in your code. So you want to, you want to get the code review size just right so that you get the right amount of feedback from your reviewers. And my probably my last uh, least favorite uh, anti-pattern is ping pong reviews. And by this, I mean, I submit code for review. The reviewer comes back with a bunch of changes. I make those changes. The reviewer comes back with more changes. I make more changes. The reviewer comes back with more changes. When is this review over? When are we going to be free from this terrible um, nightmare of, uh, of going backwards and forwards between the code author and the reviewer? And again, this comes from a poor understanding of what done looks like, who signs off the code, which criteria have to be met in order for that code to be signed off. So overall, I think we can conclude that developers hate code reviews. And you can see from those anti-patterns a number of reasons why developers don't like code reviews. So as a, as a code author, you're already coming into the review from a place of vulnerability. You have worked really hard on this code. You've done the best thing that you think you could do with the code. Obviously, you thought it through. You've talked it through perhaps with other people. And then someone is going to look at your code and criticize it. They're going to tell you all the things that's wrong with that code. So as a code author, we are not keen on code reviews. As a code reviewer, we find it difficult too. Usually, we're in the middle of implementing our own piece of functionality. We're having our flow interrupted to go and look at someone else's code. It's often not clear to us what we should be looking for, why we should be looking for it, what the goal is, how long we should be spending on these reviews, what the value is. And so it, it seems like a massive distraction to us. We generally find in these cases that um, code reviews stop code going into production. The code doesn't necessarily improve going through the code review. And we, as the code authors, don't necessarily get better either if our code reviews follow these sorts of anti-patterns. So often what you'll find when you read articles about code reviews, you'll find a lot of people talking about um, uh, why we should be doing code reviews. Because people have been talking about, uh, developers say they hate the code reviews. They say the code reviews are a massive waste of time. So the, the articles that you read talk about why we should be doing the code reviews, the value of the code reviews to kind of force us into doing them because apparently they're valuable. And yet from the inside of the code review process, we feel that they are, um, we feel that they're a massive waste of time. We feel that they are uncomfortable and don't help us to improve and don't help the applications to improve. Okay, having said all that, obviously, now I would like to offer some suggestions on how we can improve our code review processes so that we don't fall into some of those anti-patterns that we were just talking about. Before I go on to this next step, I would like to take a moment to ask Maria if there are any questions that, uh, that are worth answering right now. Uh, sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself. Uh, no, we don't have any questions right now. Great, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Either way, uh, let's move on then. Let's move on to the next thing. Before you go ahead and do any code reviews, whether you've got an existing process or whether you're trying to implement a new code review process, the first thing you need to think about is why are you doing code reviews? What is the value you hope to get out of this? What are, what are the reasons that you want to go through the process of reviewing someone else's code? And I'll give you some examples of why your team might want to do it, because there is no one reason. There is no one size fits all. The most common one is something along the lines of ensure code meets standards. This is obviously uh, somewhat vague. If this is the why, and this often happens in highly regulated environments, if this is the why, you need to, you need to list what those standards are. Are they standards in terms of uh, simple things that can be automated, like formatting, like finding common bugs, like, um, like the, the, the size of your files? Or is it ensure code meets standards in terms of um, 
each test, each file has a test and it does certain things. Enumerate what those standards are. Otherwise, ensure code meets standards is just another fluffy sentence which says, do code reviews because code reviews. Obviously, another major reason to do code reviews is to find bugs. Generally speaking, human code reviewers are not that great at this. Automated tests are good at this. Uh, compilers are good at this. Static analysis tools are good at this. So automate as much as much of this as possible. But there are things that human reviewers can do. So human reviewers are good at spotting. Oh, you're calling this method, but don't you? Did you know there's a weird side effect of that? So if the um, if the focus is on finding bugs, be aware that there are some limitations to what your human code reviewers should be doing in this area. Sharing knowledge. This is probably one of the most uh, valuable reasons to do code reviews. This cannot be automated. You can't put in place an automated tool which will automatically allow every developer on your team to understand the code, the new code that's gone into production. So code reviews are a good way to show other developers on the team what has happened and hopefully why, what problem it's fixing. To check the code is understandable. This is a little bit different to sharing the knowledge of the code. In this case, we might just have one or two reviewers who, um, who are going to check that if I come to this code later, will I be able to read it? Will I be able to understand it? Again, this is something that human code reviewers can do very well and can't be automated. Ensure the code does what it's supposed to do. Again, I hope you're going to have automated tests which run to make sure that the code meets certain criteria, but often these automated tests will, well, they'll just test what you ask them to test. A human reviewer will come and look at those tests and go, but that's not what the original bug was, or that's not what the customer asked for. And this is what a human reviewer is good at. Make sure the code is doing what the original problem, what well, fixes the original problem, what the original request was. That again, that can't be automated. You can use a code review process to collaborate on design. I'm personally a big fan of pair programming, but um, I currently work remotely and a lot of people are increasingly working remotely. So you might use some sort of code review type process to allow remote people to collaborate on the design and to, to give feedback on someone's design early, not at the end of the process. Or you might use it to evolve application code. Uh, what I have in my mind here is something along the lines of, let's say you want to spend 12 months tackling your tech debt. Instead of putting aside several uh, iterations, several sprints to tackle only tech debt, you could use something like the code review process to say, right, for every bug we fix, for every new feature we implement, we are also going to clean up the, the, the known tech debt in the files that are touched. And again, a human code reviewer is, is good at that. They're going to be able to see, OK, I can see you fix these things. Um, did, you, did you notice that actually there's some stuff in these files that you could have addressed at the same time? Now that you know why you want to do the code reviews, you should be thinking about when you want to do them. We've already mentioned this a little bit when I talked about gateway reviews. So when do you want to review the code? Do you want to review it during Im implementation? This is good if your code reviews are for evolving the design of the code together and collaborating on it. Do you want to review it when it's ready to merge? This is typically a, a gateway type code review. The code is complete, but not merged into trunk, not in production yet. Or do you want to review maybe after it's been implemented, it's in production, it's being used by customers? This again, this is more useful for knowledge sharing type code reviews. So when do you want to do the review? has a, a big impact on what type of review you're doing. More importantly than when you do the review, when is the review complete? This is really important because otherwise you end up in this ping, ping pong type review uh, situation where I keep submitting changes to my code and you keep suggesting changes to the code. So when is the review complete? Is it complete when every single reviewer agrees it's complete? Is it complete when a single individual says it's done? Is it complete when every single comment on there has been addressed? Uh, what are your what is your definition of done for this code review? Related to that, who is doing the review? Who is responsible for doing these reviews? 
So who reviews the code? Is it the whole team, as is often the case when you're trying to do knowledge sharing? Is it a single individual who is perhaps the, the gatekeeper, the senior person? Um, I'm a big fan of getting juniors to review the code because if juniors review the code and they understand what happened, then you've written really readable code. You've written really understandable code. It's also a really great way to get the juniors up to speed too. So don't just automatically assume that a code review has to be done by the senior person who says yes or no. Um, who reviews the code is going to be very much down to why you're doing the code review, what is the purpose of the review. And who signs off the code? Who is ultimately responsible for saying, yes, that's done, that's good enough? Now, you'll notice that if I, I mentioned that having juniors review the code is a really good idea, but it's possible that you don't want to leave it down to the juniors to say yes or no. So you might have a different person who signs off that code. In, um, in Upsource, we have this idea of, um, of code reviewers and code watchers. So you might want to differentiate between people who are going to be looking at the code and people who are active in, in reviewing that code. And um, also related to this, if you have a number of senior people uh, commenting on the code, you can find yourself in the situation where you have a, have a lot of comments, questions, suggestions, and some of them might be conflicting, particularly if you have a bunch of very experienced people with their own ideas on how to do things. You also need to understand in these circumstances who gets to break these deadlocks, who gets to say, no, this is the direction we're going on. It might be the code author. It might be a senior person. It might be one allocated, ran randomly allocated person for each review. It depends on the team composition. Where do you want to do the review? I think um, I'm going to pause for a second and take a couple more questions, and then I'll go on to the next section of this right now. So, Maria, what questions do we have right now? Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, one is, um, how do many developers understand that code review is a great thing and how to make them see the benefits uh, once they adopt it. I think I think knowing why you're doing the code review is a big part of that. Because if you don't understand what the purpose of the review is, then you don't really you don't really get any value out of it because you don't know what the value is. It's also possible that if your code review process is um if it doesn't have clear benefits, if it doesn't if it is painful, if it's falling into these anti-patterns and developers don't want to do it, the fact that your developers don't want to do code reviews might be pointing to a smell in your code review process. So you're not necessarily, your job might not be to force the developers to, to do code reviews, but to take a step back and have a look at the process and see what is and is not working. I, I hopefully, I'm going to cover this a bit more um, when we get to the end. All right, um, moving on to the next question. Do you suggest any particular static code analyzer? I use Sonar. Is there something better than that? Uh, I think most places use Sonar as a, as a standard. It depends a bit upon which, language you're, which languages you're using, which tools are available. But um, I used to use, in Java, I used to use a, a range of um, like fine bugs and check style and a, a bunch of other stuff like that. But um, Sonar seems to be pretty much the standard. Uh, another question is, when you mentioned design, can you be more specific what includes, uh, what enters that part? Should the developers create a sketch as UML or some type of implementation in form, in form of the code or something else? Right. I mean, that's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but um, I, I have mentioned design a couple of times. So, yes, I, I understand where that question comes from. I think what I'm saying is that if design is important to your team, and getting a clean design is is a key requirement of your of your code that should not be regulated at the end in a gateway code review if you want to choose uml diagrams if you want to just whiteboard stuff and take photos of it on your phone and share it on your shared drive if you want to um, a lot of my previous places we used to just collaborate together sketch stuff out and at the end of it um, whatever we had agreed was basically encoded into the code, so we didn't have design documents because we'd had design discussions. If you decide if you decide to schedule regular design discussions, um, but there's no output, no document, that's also fine. So it depends a lot on the team. If you have a need for a formal design, that's fine. But I think there's plenty of literature which says that doing big upfront design documents is not particularly useful. 
But if design, if a clean design is important to your code, then you need to schedule how that looks in your team. Are you going to have regular design discussions? Are you going to have an upfront design discussion? Are you going to have documentation? Are you going to do collaborating on the design in the code in terms of pairing or in terms of the code review process? And then only um, in a gateway type code review, which happens at the end, you should just be checking that the design meets the requirements that you agreed on at the beginning or during the course of that, of that process. Uh, all right, another question if uh, you're up for some more. Okay. Um, is it a good practice uh, to review complicated business logic during code review, or should I review only programming language statements? Oh, God, no. Definitely complicated business logic. That's something that um, human reviewers would be expected to, to bring to the code review, because the human reviewer is the one who understands the business logic, and the human reviewer should be the one to ask the question of, what was this problem? What problem were you trying to solve? What business value does this code add? This is absolutely something that I believe, generally speaking, code reviewers should be looking at. All right. Um, there's a question about including remote workers in a pair programming-like experience, but I think it may be a little bit out of scope. Oh, that's something that I'm really interested in, but I, I do not have a good answer for that area yet. That's something I'm thinking through at the moment. Um, I think some of this stuff, I think, I'm going to move on and look at the, the rest of the talk and then take more questions at the end, because hopefully some of, um, some of the next few sections will answer some questions. All right, let's do that. OK, great. So, so far we've looked at, uh, I've suggested you need to know why you're doing code reviews, um, when you do the code reviews, who does the code review, and now I'm saying, where do you want to do the code review? This means kind of physically, and this comes a little bit into this question of including remote workers. Uh, it's kind of physically because there are different ways to do the code review process. So let's take a look at some of the examples of, of where slash how you might want to implement your code reviews. Firstly, just pair programming. Uh, I'm a big fan of pair programming, physically sitting together in front of a computer and brainstorming ideas and checking each other's code as you go. It's, a, it's an acquired taste and some people don't really get on with it. But if you are in a team that supports pair programming, if you're pairing, you generally speaking don't need to do code reviews. That was the point about pairing. That's why it came up under extreme programming. Extreme programming said if code reviews are a good thing, we should do them all the time, which means we should be pairing all the time. Showing code to a colleague at a computer. So this is where, this is how I did my first code reviews. I would sit down with someone else and I would show them, like walk them through the code. This is what I did, this is why I did it, and that person would respond back on, um, on what they thought about my code. Obviously, if the code is very massive, this is very difficult. But generally speaking, this is quite a good way to have a communication over the code. One of the reasons why I particularly like this approach is that it kind of forces you to be nice to each other. You're sat right in front of each other. You can't have, um, you're less likely to have miscommunications over written uh, format like email or, or chat or whatever. You're going to say things like, oh, I'm not really sure what you're doing here. Can you explain to me what the rationale was rather than this code looks really terrible. I think you should fix it. So it's quite a good idea to sit down next to a colleague. Um, and kind of related to that is this idea of mob reviewing in a conference room. So sit everyone down, show them like a huge chunk of code. This might be required if, um, if you need everybody's eyes on something and they're not going to go and do it at their desks, or if you have a very important piece of work that you want to show everybody. Um, all three of these things require your team to be physically co-located in the same space for at least some period of time during the week or the sprint or the epic or whatever. So that's the kind of limitation of these approaches. If you have remote workers, you can do things like remote screen sharing. So you can use things like Skype or Slack or Hangouts or whatever to share your screen. Do the same thing that you would do if you were sat next to a colleague. Walk them through your code and get them to give you feedback. Um, if you're doing this, it's a good idea if the screen sharing software that you have allows each other to take control of the cursor. Because if I'm demoing the code to someone, they might want to take the cursor and say, oh, where does this go? What's, what's using this? Or how does this work? 
So it's a nice idea to be able to both have control over, over the screen in the circumstance. You might want to, um, that works, the last one works if you, you're physically remote, but you have time zones that overlap to some extent. So for example, Europe and the East Coast, uh, in the afternoon in Europe, in the morning in the East Coast, we can at least get together and, and share things and do things in a, in a synchronous fashion. When you want to start getting fully async, you might want to do things like, um, I'm going to check my code into a branch and someone else, when they get to it, whenever they want to, will check out that branch and look at it in their IDE. This is much better if you have uh, time zones which don't necessarily overlap. Now, you'll notice that although I work for JetBrains and although we sell a piece of code view software, my first solution to the problem of doing code views was not to suggest that you download and use a code view piece of software. This is only really useful for remote distributed teams who want a fully async way of providing feedback on their code reviews. It's also useful if you have to audit this. So large organizations do a lot of code reviews because they have to have an audit of, yes, so-and-so looked at this code and yes, they, they signed it off, they said it was correct. But generally speaking, if you're in a small co-located team, you might get more benefit, you might learn more, you might get better feedback if you literally just sit at each other's computers and say, this is the code that I wrote, what do you think? It's kind of difficult because you'll have to hear feedback to your face, but it can tend to spark a, um, a, more, productive, uh, a more productive discussion. So if you are looking at code review software, I include GitHub pull requests in this, by the way, because that, that's effectively software that enables pull, uh, code review. But if you are looking at software, I highly recommend that you download JetBrains Upsource and take a look at that. Throughout this uh, talk, I'm not really talking very specifically about the things that Upsource can give you to allow you to do better um, code reviews. I will mention it throughout the next sections, but I've already covered that on previous blog posts and screencasts, and we will give links to those at the end. So next up, only when you've identified those things, the why, the when, the who, and the where, then you can look at what you should be looking for in the code review. Because what you should be looking for depends a lot upon why are you doing the review? At what point in the development process does this review happen? Who is doing the review? Are they senior, are they junior? And where, which, in which way are you doing the review? Are you doing it physically side by side or doing a piece of software? Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I don't necessarily expect you to read all of this while I'm talking to you at the same time. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, there are lots and lots and lots of things that you could be looking for when you look at someone else's code under review. You could basically pull it apart into pieces through an endless matrix of, of different things to look for. So you need to choose as part of your code review process, given the constraints of your reviewer, of your review, given the strengths of your application, given the constraints of your team and how you work, given all of that, then this is the short list of things that we should be looking for. So firstly, human reviewers should not be doing anything that can be automated. The value of a human code reviewer is doing the stuff that cannot be automated. Human reviewers should not be looking at formatting or anything that could be done with static analysis. Like I say, you really need to understand the constraints of your system. If you are working on perhaps an internal system for your organization, it's hosted on, on internal hardware, which is physically separate from the internet and the outside world, you probably are not going to look very hard at security in the code because it's already got physical constraints, which, which means that you don't have to worry about that in your code. Um, similarly, if you're not working on a low latency, uh, high frequency trading application, you probably don't care about nanosecond latency. So there's no need to look at every possible thing that could potentially be wrong with your code and have a tick list which is 100 miles long. You should be narrowing it down to the things which really matter for your application. For example, if you are doing a knowledge sharing type code review, the purpose is not to reject the code. The purpose is not to say this code is bad. It's not to find problems. The purpose of this code review is for me, the reviewer, to look at the code that you, the author, wrote and say whether I understand it or not or see whether it makes sense. 
So a lot of the a lot of the feedback I'll be giving will be things like, oh, I didn't really, could you rename this method to something which is a bit more understandable? Or I don't really understand why um, why this works in this way. Maybe if you add an extra automated test, that will tell me what's what the inputs and outputs are. So when I'm reviewing code, when it comes down to knowledge sharing, I'm not looking to find reasons to reject the code. I'm not looking at things that are wrong with the code. My goal is to understand the code and feed back things that I don't understand so the author can make it more understandable. If one of the constraints is that I'm going to do the code, the code review at the end when the work is complete, then as I mentioned before, I think focusing on the low level design of this code is not a good idea. This is not the right time to be focusing on design patterns, on solid, on um, uh, and reusability. Well, it depends a bit, but it's not, it's not the time to be thinking about big architectural changes. If design is important to you, as I mentioned, the design needs to be done not as part of the code review. It needs to be done as part of your development process in a different way, perhaps as an upfront design, perhaps as an ongoing collaborative effort, perhaps having checkpoints where you check with someone, with a senior person maybe, that your design is on track. But if your code review happens at the end of your implementation, you shouldn't be looking at stuff which is going to re require the author to rewrite the whole of the code because that's just a massive waste of everybody's time. If you are doing a gateway type code review where your job is to check the code when it is complete and say whether it's ready to go or not, generally speaking, it's a good idea to have a list of specific checks that you are looking for. And when it meets those checks, it should be ready to go. Generally speaking, if your code review happens at the end and it's a gateway type review, there should be no enormous shocks when I submit my code for review as a code author. I should know what is being looked for. My code will probably more or less uh, meet those criteria already because I understand what the criteria are in advance. If the code review is happening at the end, it's literally a box ticking exercise of does it more or less do what it's supposed to do? Does it meet these standards? It's not a place for pulling it to pieces and asking people to start all over again. Now that we've looked at all of those other things, then I want to look at the nitty gritty of how we actually do the code view. So firstly, I've mentioned this before, automate everything you can. I just can't repeat that enough. Automate everything you can. Human code reviewers are expensive in terms of time and money, um, so you don't want to be getting them to do stupid stuff. So you should be automating formatting checks, the build, testing, including performance, security, end-to-end, -end, unit integration. You should be automating deployment. Obviously, not everyone has this luxury, but as much as possible, you should be automating these things so that your reviewers don't have to worry about that stuff. Now, when I'm submitting my code for review, what are the sort of things I should be bearing in mind in terms of, I'm going to use the term best practice, but I, even though that's the title of this talk, I'm not a massive fan of the term best practice because one size generally doesn't fit all. But generally speaking, when I'm submitting for review, I should be trying to keep the reviews as small as possible. Now, obviously, sometimes I'm going to be working on a big feature or a big change. And if this is the case, I might want to submit for review maybe every day or every couple of days and do some small changes rather than wait for it, wait for a big bang right at the end. But the review should be small so the reviewer knows what to look for and so it's nice and focused. I think a code reviewer, a code author, should annotate their code with what they were thinking when they wrote this code. So generally speaking, these guidelines are kind of um, from the point of view of using a formal code review tool like Upsource or um, doing GitHub type pull requests. And generally speaking, um, we're talking about when you're reviewing code at the end, when it's complete. <clears throat> now, if you're using a tool like Upsource or, or GitHub, then you can write comments either in line in the code or you can write comments at the review level. And as a code author, you shouldn't just be waiting for the reviewer to write comments. As a code author, I can be saying, look, I've chosen this design because of X, Y, and Z, because I've considered these things. Or I wrote this method here because of X, Y, and Z, and because these things happen there. This way, the reviewer knows that you've thought these things through and that you've done things for a reason. Now, of course, you did everything for a reason, but the reviewer doesn't know what your thought process was. So it's useful to annotate your code with the things you were thinking when you made those decisions. 
when I'm reviewing the code, firstly, it should be clear who is reviewing. Is it the whole team? Is it, uh, is it a senior person? Is it the juniors? So who should be doing the reviewing? Upsource, again, has this idea of code reviewers and code watchers. And if I'm a watcher, I'm going to assume I can kind of look at the code if I want to. If I'm a reviewer, then I'm, I assume that I'm expected to um, have some comments on this code and to provide some feedback on the code. It's important to respond in a timely fashion, by which I mean as soon as possible. Now, I know it's really hard because you're in the middle of coding your own thing. You don't want to stop that and context switch and change to, uh, to look at someone else's code. But honestly, the longer you take before you review someone else's code, the more difficult it is for that person to then context switch and switch back into that code to make the changes. Also, if you're doing a gateway type review where the code has not been merged yet, all the time that the code spends in code review and has not been accepted yet is effectively waste because the code has been implemented but is not being used. So we really want to get through code review as fast as possible. Our goal is to try and get the review to get the code into production. Our goal is to get the code to the user. Our goal is not to stop that. So respond as quickly as possible. Upsource has the idea of due dates, which can kind of help people, help poke people in the direction of, yes, please respond to this review by this time. It's helpful to have a checklist of what I'm looking for. So out of all those millions of things I could be looking for, what are the things I should really be looking for in, uh, in this particular code review? Now, when I'm writing comments, as a reviewer, I'm going to be writing comments on the review. Those comments should be bearing in mind why, why we're doing the code review, at what point in the development process are we reviewing the code, and what should we be looking for? So I'm not necessarily just writing comments on, oh, I don't really like the way this is. Like, well, okay, that's fine. But I don't really like the way this is because it's difficult to understand or because I think it's going to be not great performance or, or something specific. So comments should be written with the, the criteria for the code review in mind. Be constructive with your comments, by which I mean be nice, obviously. But I mean be nice and be constructive. I personally think it's a really good idea to try and find things in the code review that you like. So I'll quite often write a comment which says, uh, oh, I really like the way that you've broken this up here. Or, I really like this method name. It's really, it's really good. Generally speaking, when we do code reviews, we aren't really encouraged to do that because we think our job is to find problems. But our job is also to try and make the code review process not unpleasant and to help people to learn. And if somebody's done something well, we need to reward them for that so they carry on doing that thing too. That's part of the learning process. We learn by also being praised as well as being told this is wrong. So be, um, be nice, be constructive. So the comments should relate to the code, not to the author. And, um, and they should also uh, be specific. So this, this is not great because of X, Y, and Z. You need to do this to fix this problem. So um, one of the things I like about Upsource is it allows you to label the comments. So I can label them as things like praise, or I can label it as a bug or a showstopper, or I can label it as my personal preference, or I can label it as um, uh, potentially tech debt. Okay, I think this is not great, but I think we should come back to it later. And then this way, when the code author reads my comments, they have a clear idea of, is this a problem that I really need to address, or is this just something that is a personal preference of the author? And it makes it easier for me as the, as the code author to, to decide which changes to implement. And finally, it'll be easier to understand whether the review is complete or not. If all the showstoppers are fixed, then the code should be complete. So speaking of which, once we've gone through this cycle probably a couple of times of um, writing some code, accepting some comments on it, making some changes based on those comments, finally at the end, the, the code reviewer is going to decide whether to accept or reject this code review. In fact, in Upsource, we say accept or raise concern because we don't reject code. Because generally speaking, you're not going to delete it. It's not going to go away forever. You're just saying, OK, look, it's great, but I'd really like you to make some changes before I think it's really great. So I'm either going to accept it, say it meets all of my specifications, or I'm going to raise a concern. And if I've raised a concern or raised several concerns, 
it needs to be clear to the code author what steps they need to take in order for me as the code reviewer to change my mind and accept that. So as the code reviewer, I need to say, look, I've raised the concerns. You need to fix this, 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 and this before um, I consider it to be done. And we can either use the labels on our comments or we can even use, um, we have checkboxes, checklists in Upsource to allow us to say, um, you know, fix these things and then it'll be done. As a code author, I'm then going to go away and make some of those changes. Uh, again, I need to respond in a timely fashion. I, am, I, can't, I may have gone off and started working on something else, but again, my focus should be to try and get this code review finished so that my code gets merged so that it's being used. Respond to the comments. Uh, the comments might be questions, so I can answer those questions. They might be um, comments like, obviously, can you fix these things? So I'm going to try and fix those things. Upsource allows you to also use um, emojis and reactions uh, to comments. So you could basically use some of those to say, I acknowledge this. Rather than having to write a whole response, I might just use some of those reactions to say, OK, I've read this, and, and yes or no, or whatever. Um, and then finally, once we've gone through this process a few times, trying to decide whether we whether the code review is actually good to go or not, we need to know so that the goal is to try and accept the code review. The goal is not what I said at the beginning. The goal is not to find problems in the code and to try and stop code going into production. No, the goal is to make sure the code is good enough to go into production. The goal is to try and get the code into production. It needs to be clear who signs off the code review, who is ultimately responsible for saying, yes, it's good to go. And at what point, which things need to have been completed in order for that person to be happy for that code to be complete and ready to go. So in order to reduce the pain of code reviews, in order to have productive, effective code reviews, you need to have clear objectives. And I believe those clear objectives come from understanding why you're doing the code reviews in the first place. Remember, there are lots of different reasons from finding bugs to improving readability to sharing the knowledge. Uh, there's lots of different reasons why you might want to do code reviews. When you do the review, it makes a difference on what is sensible to feed back to the code author. So if you're reviewing code right at the beginning, you are going to be able to suggest a lot more changes in terms of directions the code can go in, but it also doesn't make sense to be really nitpicky about particular names, for example, because those things might change over, over the time that the code is going to evolve. Who does the review and who is responsible for signing off the review? This is really re helpful to, to understand that, to make sure the code review doesn't end up in limbo. Where are you going to the re review the code? You don't necessarily have to use a tool like Upsource. You might just sit down with your peers and say, uh, can you look at this code? Does it look okay? Only then can you figure out what is sensible to look for when you're reviewing code, given those previous constraints. And then when you know all of the, the why, when, who, where, and what, then you can have an idea of what your actual process is. What are the... the the nitty gritty small things you're going to do in terms of uh, in terms of labeling your comments, in terms of using this tool, in terms of um, in terms of this, that, and the other. Only you can only pin down your specific process once you understand why, when, who, where, and what. Remember, the goal of uh, of coding generally, but the goal of your code review is to ship the code. The goal is to approve the code so it can be used by users, so it adds value to your business. The goal is not to prove how clever you are as an author or as a reviewer. At this point, now we can take any more questions. Uh, thank you, Tricia. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you present uh, on code reviews. We have a few questions, uh, although some of them, I believe, have been answered already. So um, we only have a few minutes left and I'm not sure what, that we'll be able to answer everything, but if not, we'll add them to the blog post uh, with the recording. So uh, the first question is, is there as, um, sorry, uh, how frequent, frequent should code reviews be? What factors would have an impact upon this? Yeah, I mean, obviously the answer is it depends. <laughs> I think it's less about time and more about size. 
So you know how coding is. Sometimes you can spend like a whole week trying to solve a problem and it turns out that at the end of that week, you've written two lines of code. And that's not because you haven't been working. It's because it was a difficult problem and you didn't really, you didn't really know what those two lines of code were. So, you know, I could say the code should be reviewed every day, but that might not be sensible. Um, but I think that code should be reviewed. My personal preference is really if, if it's more than like maybe four or five files with six or seven lines of code in each, I'm probably just not going to look at it. So I think um, code should be reviewed once you've got um, any more than two or three files with changes which are kind of significant enough to review that you're comfortable with. Because the other thing is that sometimes we spend all week solving this problem and we fix this and we do this and we, we write this bit of code here and then we, and we've got loads and loads of code. We could get it reviewed at that point, but we know that over the next couple of days, we're actually probably going to delete a lot of that code and shrink it down to something much more readable. So it's really, it's really about size. But really, within a week's worth of coding, you really do need to have some sort of sanity check whether it's a code review or whether it's just sitting down with someone saying, look, you know, I've been working on this for a week and um, I either haven't got anywhere or I've gone a long way, you know, can you take a look? Yeah. Um, here's another question. How do you defer an aggressive, unhelpful code review? <laughs> um, I'm assuming it means aggressive, unhelpful in terms of the reviewer. Uh, yes, I I have struggled. I have been in these sorts of situations, um, whether it's aggressive, whether it's negative, whatever. This is why I feel it's very clear to uh, it's very important to have these clear objectives, because in my experience, uh, aggressive or unhelpful code reviewers are not um, they're not focusing on trying to get trying to make the code better, trying to get the code in production. They're often trying to focus on um, on saying their piece on being heard so this this can be very very frustrating particularly if you are not um if you don't really have the power to shut that person down so sometimes it's a case of trying to go to someone higher and saying look i'm trying to get the code approved i'm trying to get it into production i'm having trouble with i can't get it past this reviewer sometimes you might need to go to a higher power sometimes it's a case of going to a peer um, your peers might be able to wade in on a discussion and say, no, look, this is good enough. Uh, it depends a lot on the situation, and I don't really have a magic answer for this. And um, and there have been studies that show that there are certain types of people on GitHub who suffer from this as authors more than, more than others. So um, I don't have a good answer for that. If it's open source, it's very tricky. If it's inside an organization, there's usually someone you can turn to to say, look, my goal is to try and deliver this piece of work and this person is blocking me. All right. Uh, we still have some questions and answers, but unfortunately the time has run out. But a lot of these questions are sort of deep and that would be a nice, uh, they, would, they would make a nice discussion. So perhaps, uh, a conversation on Twitter would be a better place or comments on the blog post with the recording. Uh, they're not necessarily technical, but more about process and approaches to code review. So oh, I would love to I would love to see them as comments on the blog post and have like some sort of discussion and have other people give their answers too, because I personally don't think that I have all the answers. It's very much a case of um, different teams, different people have different approaches and it's a good idea to shop around for those answers. I agree. Well, uh, thank you, Tricia, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for really interesting questions. We will post a recording of this webinar on our blog post, and we will share the link to it on Twitter. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.